today. Uh, just a couple things. We've been having some technical difficulties with our technology randomly. Um, so I'll, I'll, fill, I'll flesh that out in just a second, but I just want to apologize for making you guys wait six minutes, uh, especially for you online. Um, but welcome to Fellowship Baptist Church. Uh, I, I hope uh, our audio is coming through to you guys. I'm getting the thumbs up, so uh, everyone on the internet should be able internet everyone <laughs> should be able to hear us. Um, I'm a little flustered, as you can tell, but no. <laughs> uh, but with that. Uh, one of our problems is that no sound is coming from our computer into our house, so we will not be able to uh, have worship this morning because we can't play any sound um, for some reason. Um, and I, I didn't have time to put together a scripture to read because I wasn't planning for this. <laughs> so we'll move after this into um, the sermon. If you have a scripture to read, you can feel free to start that off that way. Um, but we will spend some time in prayer. And uh, thankfully, biblically, the worship is not just singing. It's also the preaching of the word, but also our prayer and our fellowship here together as we worship God together. So although we won't be singing this morning, uh, uh, let's just worship God in our hearts and in our minds. And, uh, and I apologize. And hopefully by next week, we'll have everything back up and running. Who knew from one Sunday to the next, those little fairies can get in here and change everything. So, no. <laughs> but if you have your bulletin, uh, go ahead and open it, and I will just uh, touch on some of the uh, highlights. Um, we were handed down new recommendations from the government, or not even recommendations, sorry. Uh, it's law. It's, we have to follow. And uh, uh, one thing you'll notice is that now, even while you're seated, you must be wearing a mask because this is considered a public space and it's by the bylaws that uh, restrict us for that. So we want to thank you for um, wearing your mask even while seated. Um, obviously, you can take drinks and whatnot and remove your mask for that. But uh, for the, uh, the most part of your time here, please have your mask on uh, just so we can honor our ruling authorities. Uh, also with that, for a time, we'll be moving to video worship, uh, just not this morning, as I've already stated. Um, uh, but at that, again, we're moving back to our old rules where there's no singing, uh, but you are welcome to hum along with your mask on. Uh, other than that, I believe those are the big ones that come with the change. We uh, thankfully had a very amazing reopening committee that the elder board put together, and we intentionally restricted ourselves to one-third before they even handed us down that rule. Uh, so there wasn't much of a pivot that we had to change. Um, so uh, if you see any of those reopening committee members, just thank them because they did a great job and it helped us with these new rules not to panic too much. Um, this morning, Pastor Dave is with us again for the next four weeks for sure. Uh, and he is going to be talking, uh, starting us and finishing with us an Advent series called The Four Characters of Christmas. And today we're starting uh, with the character of Mary. And you can see the title and reference there on your bulletin. Uh, everything else, all the extracurriculars are still at this time either suspended or moved to um, Zoom. So your life groups, uh, youth to suspend it, but as I've sent out emails to all your parents and posted on our social media, uh, Bailey and I are putting together massive, awesome Christmas uh, presents for you, youth baskets, I should call them, not, uh, and it's filled with goodies, but also some swag, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we will be delivering those to you. We're going to assemble them, and then we'll let them sit for the appropriate amount of time, and then we will deliver them to your doorstep uh, without any uh, real interaction. Just, you know, have fun and enjoy your present. Uh, so so if your parents have not signed you up, or parents, if you have not signed your kids up for that, please do so, or they will not get a gift, uh, because I don't know where they live or how many to buy for if you don't sign them up. Uh, other than that, I don't think I'm missing any real important announcements that I see. Uh, the women's prayer meeting is still meeting on Zoom on uh, Wednesday, and if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, please uh, see Donna Nielsen, message her, or talk to Norman this morning, and he can relay the message. Uh, if you have a tithe or offering that you'd like to give this morning, uh, you can drop it off here after your service. And the last thing is, is uh, with the rules allowing us to have a church service, they also said no social gatherings, so we do ask that you keep uh, the social aspect to a minimum after service, and please uh, begin to shuffle your way out after service. 
service is over. I know that is very hard to do, especially us Baptists who love to talk and, and hug each other and everything. But for the time being, I think we can follow these guidelines and restrictions and honor uh, the rules that uh, the government has put on and the elders are asking us to follow as well. So uh, not saying you can't say hi or talk to anyone, uh, but just try to keep it to a minimum. But without further ado, I will pray. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, let me just. Yeah, let me just find my Bible app. It's probably in one of the back folders because I don't use it much. Because I like my paper Bible, okay? You <laughs> Before you judge me, no. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Psalm 136, did you say? Uh, 136, okay. Um, and you want me to read up to what verse? Read, read the first half of the verse, and then read the second, because there's oh. three verses in there. Before you, they get yeah. Okay, yes. All right, so I'm reading from the ESV. But uh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to, uh, to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him alone does great wonders. To him by his understanding made the heavens. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. And to him who made the great lights. The sun to the rule over the day. The moon and the stars to rule over the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. And brought Israel from among them. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two. And made Israel to pass through the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his hosts in the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings. And killed mighty kings. Shion, king of the Amorites. And Og, king of Bashan. And gave their land as a heritage a heritage to Israel, his servant. It is he who remembered us in our low estate and rescued us from our foes. He who gives food to all flesh. Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. In his steadfast love, the Hebrew word is hesed, and it's connected to his name, which is Yahweh, which means that God, that the hesed, his steadfast love, I love how the ESV translates it because it can't just be translated as love, but it has to be translated as something that is steadfast, something that holds and is tied to his name, which is Yahweh, which is a covenant name. So when, when it says his steadfast love, we can know for sure that his love will never fail us, nor will it dry up. Because it's tied to his name, which means he's faithful to us. So when Jesus died on the cross and purchased us, his steadfast love is now ours forevermore. And we never have to wonder if it's for us or against us. Because he's always for us, as the Romans says, right? Amen? Amen. His steadfast love. All right, I'll pray. Thank you for that.
recommendation. I thought it was like Psalms 119. We're going to be here for two hours, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was getting a little worried there. No, I get it. <laughs> no, it was good. All right. Bow your heads and pray with me. Father, I thank you, Lord, for innovation. Lord, I thank you for uh, Dean and his suggestion for that, God, as we might not repeat things much in our church setting, Lord. Uh, we might deem that more for liturgical, but there's power in when we repeat and speak your word out, your living and active word. And Father, we thank you for your steadfast love. We thank you, Lord, that you've sent your son to die for the ones whom, whom were given to him, Lord. And we thank you, Father, that we never have to question if his love is for us, Lord, that it, he's never regretted saving us. Although when we sin, we must walk through repentance. We know that he's a loving father and we can go to his open arms with joy and confidence, Lord. So, Father, I thank you for all those who are meeting with us online today in their living rooms or wherever they might find themselves. And God, for the ones here in this room, may your steadfast love shine over our lives today. And Father, as we move through Advent and we start to prepare for Christmas, a joyful time, Lord, but maybe a little hard this year as traditions went to the wayside and other things seem to be different, Lord, may we know, God, that the story of Christmas is the story of Jesus entering in, clothing himself with humanity to die on the cross so that we might live with God forever. So Father, as we walk through this, may we be reminded that although it might be different and it might be hard and we might be frustrated, Lord, you are good. And the story of Christmas is an amazing story. It's good news. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as Dave comes to lead us and lead us faithfully through this Advent series, Lord, I ask that you bless him as he delivers the message that you laid on his heart. And Father, may it fall onto our ears and bring about conviction to areas we need and spur us forward to be more like Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Dave, at this time you can come. Um, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles as I'm taking off this mask and turn to Luke chapter 1. See if I can do this without knocking the whole, mask, <laughs> the whole mic off. There we go. All right. As I was looking out uh, at everybody, I thought of a conversation a couple of pastors had where I'm they were talking about the attendance in their church, and uh, one of them asked the other, you know, how, how big is your church? And he said, well, we're comfortably full. We can lie down in the pews. So, <laughs> uh, well, we're comfortably full, uh, but we're really far apart from one another. Um, we're going to be reading in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, and I'm just going to do a bit of an introduction, and then we'll get into those verses, so you can have those ready. But as somebody said, we're starting Christmas-themed messages, for, and we'll go for four Sundays in a row where we're looking at Christmas theme, and we've kind of tied them under one idea, the four characters or not the four characters, but four characters at Christmas. And by that, we don't mean um, four individuals we're going to look at as much as four character qualities, uh, the character qualities in these people. So today we're going to look at the character of Mary. And, um, you know, as I was thinking about this, I thought if you were to draft up, if you didn't, um, you know, do this at Christmas time, if you... Just uh, sometime in August, you went up to somebody and you said, who do you think the top 10 individuals in the Bible are? I wonder how many would mention Mary. Um, you know, you might think of somebody like Moses. Moses is described as the most humble person in the world. He would probably get top billing there, one of the top billings. Or Abraham. Abraham is called the father of all who believes. And, um, and is called the friend of God. Or you might think of David. David was the first and, or the second and greatest king of Israel. And he's also described as a man after God's own heart. So he might, he might be up there. You know, you might think of Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' BFFs. One of the three best friends that Jesus had, <clears throat> will have forever. Um, and, um, or John. John was another of the BFFs, and uh, John described himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so all these people are pretty significant. But what about Mary? 
Mary was personally chosen by God to carry and to give birth and to raise up the Son of God. You know, she was the one who nursed him. She was the one who woke up for him in the middle of the night. She was the one that God entrusted to train him and to to pour out love upon him and to protect him. Uh, Mary, I mean, if you and I were going to handpick somebody to raise our children, we would probably pick somebody of outstanding character, right? And I think God did the same thing. He chose a person without, with um, just outstanding character qualities. So we want to look at those character qualities that we find in these verses here. But I want to ask you, why should we care? Like, why should we care what her character qualities are? And I'll give you an important suggestion. And you might have to chew on this a bit. You might not even like it at first, but think about it. Uh, very importantly, justification by God is a gift, but rewards are given to those who deserve them. Justification, that is God declaring us just and righteous and so qualified for heaven, is a gift based on the merits of Christ, but not rewards. Rewards are, are meted out by God according to what we have done. And so, for example, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he says this, For we must all, so he's including himself, this is Christians, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive what is due us for the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. So Paul fully expected to stand before God and to receive rewards or losses uh, in his life based on what he had done. Rewards are based on what we do. And so what we read then is that God recognizes and applauds and favors and blesses outstanding character. Our justification isn't dependent on that. Our faith gives us justification, and our life will be transformed by that. But the Bible promises rewards for deeds over and over. In other words, we can impress God, in a sense, or we can disappoint him. And so, um, in fact, God even talks about spitting the lukewarm out of his mouth. You know, when you uh, maybe grab a glass of milk, you're expecting it to be either cold or hot chocolate or something, and it's lukewarm, Ugh, just gross. You want to spit it out of your mouth? That's how God feels about the lukewarm. So, do you want to be rewarded by God? Do you want to be the object of his favor in blessing in this life? Then we should consider the character of Mary and seek to imitate it in our lives. So we're going to be reading verses 26 to 38 of Luke chapter 1. And I I know that in these verses, we find some deep theological themes. We find the idea of the virgin birth, and we could look into that. You know, we find the idea of the two natures of the Son of God, and we could look at that. Uh, We find the idea of the kingdom of God, and we could develop that. Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God on earth, so that would be a very good theme to look at. But today, we simply want to observe the character qualities of Mary. So let's read them and see if you can spot some, and then I'll draw out three of them. So we read in verse 26, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Now you need to understand that an engagement in Jesus' day was as solemn as a marriage is to us. Only they were separated. They didn't consummate the marriage. They were considered basically married by the engagement. In fact, if someone was unfaithful during this betrothal period, she was charged or he was charged with adultery. That's how much this engagement meant, this pledge. And Joseph was a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. 
So here's a person that God looked upon and highly favored her. Mary was greatly troubled at the, his words and wondered what kind of greeting this must be, might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So this kingdom that Jesus came to establish, I'm in it. I'm in it right now. And this kingdom will spread over the earth. And one day, it will demolish all opposition to the kingdom of God. We'll have a new heaven and a new earth. And righteousness will reign on it. Verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. So I want to look at three qualities that we find in Mary in these verses. And the first one is this. Mary was receptive. That is, she was open to hearing God's voice. Now, just think of her story for a little bit. When we read of her here, she is just living the life of a normal teenage Girl. So picture this. Um, she's just a normal small town girl. It reminds me of Billy Joel for some reason, Oliver. Uh, she was just a normal small town girl. She lived in a little community called Nazareth. Uh, she lived in, in a normal Jewish culture. She had been recently engaged in the normal way. She was fulfilling her normal duties in life, you know, fixing dinners, cleaning the house with her mom, doing the laundry and things like that. She was anticipating a normal wedding. She was expecting to be a normal wife and to have normal children. She was leading a normal life. She was a normal person. But when a messenger of God an angel from God comes in and breaks into her normal, she is receptive. She is open to hearing the voice of God. I mean, she gets the picture very quickly. She knows, okay, this is not normal, and this is not going to lead to a normal life. And you get that sense, you know, right after the announcement in verse 31 you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. The angel goes on to describe this son, but Mary is still stuck on that first statement. Her words are, her mind is still on, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. She's still thinking of that. And verse 34, she says, how will this be since I am a virgin? In other words, this seems impossible to her. And yet, Mary has this great quality of being open to whatever God might say to her. She's open. She's receptive. However uncomfortable, however unusual, whatever it might cost, however demanding it might be, and because she's open, she hears the voice of God. She hears the voice of God. Now, does God find that in us? Do we hear God speaking into our lives? Are we receptive to hearing the voice of God? George Bernard Shaw wrote a, a play titled St. Joan. And in one part of this play, Joan of Arc is always hearing the voice of God. And the king is very angered by this. And he says to her, oh, your voices, your voices. 
Why don't your voices come to me? I am the king, not you. And Joan of Arc says to her, they do come, but you do not hear them. You've not sat in the field in the evening listening to them. But if you prayed from your heart and listened, you would hear the voice of God as well as I do. God is always speaking. God is a communicating God. He's been talking to you all this last week. Have you heard him? He speaks to us through our conscience. He speaks to us through convictions that he's brought into our lives. He speaks to us through the examples of others. And we feel something from God as we watch somebody else. He speaks to us especially through his word, the Bible, through lessons, through sermons. God is always speaking. God is not a shy wallflower. You know, he's not an introvert who never likes to come out of his shell. God is out there. He's always speaking. He has always been a speaking God. He's a present God. He's not aloof. He's not indifferent. He's not remote. He speaks. God is love, and love communicates. God is always love, and God is always communicating. Are we listening? Are we open to hearing You know, we may feel like we're just normal people, but God speaks to normal people. And if we're willing to hear God, God will speak into our lives. Now, being receptive to God always leads to his favor, always leads to blessing. But it's not easy. You can be misunderstood. You can become um, despised by others. You can... Suffer loss if you're open. to You can lose your normal. You can lose what you're expecting if you're open to hearing God. You can experience rejection. And so we need to have the next quality that you see in Mary. And that next quality is that Mary was self-forgetting. Self-forgetting. Now, just put yourself... Uh, You know, try to make yourself go back to that day and age and that small little village that she lived in and just put yourself into her sandals. She was living in the, the first century. She was living in a little Jewish village. And the worldview of the people who lived in this village was shaped by the Mosaic law. And the Mosaic law said then unmarried but pregnant women deserve to be stoned. Now in Jesus' day, that hardly ever happened, but the attitude that you deserved it was very strong. And so Mary knew right away that there would be a stigma to her life and it would last for her whole life. She would become an outcast. And Joseph, what about Joseph? What would he think? What would he do? Now, you know, Mary was very aware that openness to God would likely lead to a cost of losing all her normal, all her regular expectations. And so her response in verse 38 is really quite amazing. She says, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. In other words, she says, I am the Lord's servant. I am not living for myself. My wishes are less important than God's wishes. I want my life to be used by him. I want to do whatever the master says. I'm the servant. I am willing to bear that cost whatever it might be. And you know, I wonder how she felt just not too many weeks later when she went, wow, it's been seven weeks, eight weeks, and I'm pregnant. I really am pregnant. Like, did her heart break as she imagined Joseph finding out the shock and dismay for him? 
Was she filled with dread what the community might do? Did she think about and anticipate the sadness that her family would experience, that their daughter had become a public shame in their community? And did she see her dreams of normal expectation just slipping through her fingers? And her whole life was going to be changed. She would probably never, ever get married. Do you think she had sleepless nights and perhaps cried herself to sleep? And yet, she said, I am the Lord's servant. Quite astounding. I am here to do what He wants. Even if I'm misunderstood, even if I'm rejected, even if I'm not liked. And you know, I thought of this, that servants are like employees, you know. When I'm on the job, I am not thinking or giving my time or energy to the things I personally want to get done back at home. If you're a good employee, then you are always focused on what the job is and getting that done. And that's what she was saying. I'm on the clock. I'm a servant of God. If this is what you're telling me to do, then I'll hop to it. This is what I'm going to do. I'm your servant. Now, God is speaking all the time. And if we are listening, and if we're receptive, we're going to be directed by Him into inconvenient and costly things. You can count on it. Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. There's a cost. And so this is a test. This is a test for us. And here's the test. Does my following God end up leading me into things I would not have chosen myself? Costly things. Difficult things. Hard things. There's not a single person of greatness in God's eyes who has not had to choose what God wants instead of what they want. It's a quality in all those who are great to God. And then the next point I want us to look at is Mary was far-sighted. You know, how, how could this teenage girl consciously choose to do what God wanted, to accept what God wanted, when she would have known everything that was lying ahead of her? Not in all its detail, but the general picture was ugly and bad. Full of misunderstanding. Full of disbelief. How was she able to make a choice that would seem to ruin her life and rob her of all happiness. And the answer is that she didn't look just to the immediate future, she looked to the distant future. And that's true of everybody, by the way, who is like Mary. Verse 48, she says this, Think of it. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. You know, the current generation, many of those people may misunderstand me, but I am going to be known as a person who is blessed. Blessed by God. And so Mary looked beyond, you know, the immediate loss. She looked beyond the immediate shame. She looked beyond the immediate cost and hardship. She looked beyond the pregnancy and the birth, and she looked right past even her whole lifespan. And she knew that all generations would call her blessed. In other words, she saw the great picture. And that's a, that's a driving thing for every solid Christian. They live in light of, of not the near horizon, but the distant horizon. That affects all their choices in life. And so she saw the big fit picture. And she held, you know, loosely to what she wanted now so that she could have the future reward. She wanted that. She knew she would be validated. She knew she would be smiled upon. She knew that she would be lauded and praised. And you know, it takes faith to do that. It takes faith. We, we believe that God's will is best and that it leads to reward. We believe that. We believed in the, in the distant horizon. And so we live 
so differently from everybody else. We're not having to grasp after money. We're not having to grasp after experiences or things. We believe there is a greater reward in the greater horizon. I remember um, when I was just a boy, um, a missionary came and told us about how uh, Native people in the tribal group he was with had figured out how to kill a monkey just with a machete. Now, you imagine that for a second. Uh, monkeys are pretty fast, and when they see danger, they go straight up a tree. How is a person supposed to kill a monkey with a machete? He said, it's very easy. They get a coconut. Maybe you've heard this. They carve a small hole in the top, and they empty the coconut out. They stake that coconut to the ground, and then they put a small trinket in there. And a monkey will come along and stick his face into the coconut and see the trinket. He'll reach in and grab the trinket, but now his hand that could slip in open is closed around an object and it cannot come out as long as he's holding on to that trinket. And no matter what, he's screaming when the hunter with the machete is coming. He will not let go of that, machete, that uh, trinket. And so the hunter can just whack him and he's got him. Now, it takes faith to let go of the trinkets of life. It takes faith to see that these trinkets are just passing. And you know, the path of life is just littered with trinkets, all the way from here to heaven, just littered with trinkets. And the person who lives by faith will just walk right past many, many of those trinkets. Not every trinket is a bad trinket, but many of those trinkets, we won't grab onto them. We don't, we don't want to lose. We're better investors than that. We're listening to the voice of God. We're open to it, whatever you might say. And we are self-denying because we want, we want to serve God for the future, for eternity. And so today we think of Mary as a great person because she was receptive. She was open to hearing from God. And she was self-denying. But I really don't think that what we read in these verses was the first time Mary acted like that. I, I think people who face these momentous decisions have, peri uh, have frequently made that kind of a choice with the little things in life. With, you know, they've done this a dozen times a day. Great Christians are receptive to God's voice and denying themselves dozens of times every day, you know, in the very small and the very unnoticed things in life, you know, whether to watch that TV show or to view that clip on YouTube, whether, whether to serve somebody in some small way or not be bothered, whether to contribute financially to the kingdom of God or go, ah, you know, uh, how are we ever going to go on a holiday if I keep doing that? You know, they, Just in the many small practices of everyday living, they hear the voice of God. You know, it's a wonderful thing to know God is communicating to you, to know that you're actually walking and talking with God and he's directing your life. Mary had that quality. So I want to encourage you um, and give you some practical steps on these three things. Um, and so here they are. The first practical step is to be open to God speaking to you. Do you expect God to speak to you? Joan of Arc apparently did. She sat and she listened for the voice of God. Be open to God speaking to you. Ask God to speak to you, and he will. Listen to truth that God makes clear in his word. Don't ignore it. Don't brush it off. Don't say, I'll think about it later. But listen to the truth that he makes clear in his word, and live it out. And then listen. Listen to that inner sense of obligation or that sense of opportunity that God is putting on your heart at times. Listen to that. Listen to the voice of God. And then the second thing is, count the cost of doing what God says and then accept it unreservedly. Mary counted that cost, right? She knew what she was getting into. And so, could it cost you in a relationship if you listen to the voice of God? 
And if it does, accept it. This could cause a misunderstanding. This is, could cause somebody to accuse me of being intolerant or something like that. Could it cost you materially if you listen to the voice of God? Listen anyway. Accept that. So count the cost of doing what God says and accept that. And then think about the future. On your deathbed, what will matter to you most? Those trinkets or that you listen to the voice of God and followed? That your kids can look at you as somebody who listened to God and did his best or her best to follow that. Think about your legacy and whether your children or your friends or your nephews and nieces will see that. So I would like to just close in prayer, and I'd like us just to listen to God for a minute, and, um, and we'll do that as we pray together. Our Father, we thank you so much that you are love, and love communicates. You love to be close to us. You love to speak into our lives. And dozens of times every day, you speak to us if we're listening. And if we listen, we keep hearing. Help us to be like that. Help us to be people who are listening. Perhaps you will not just to show an act of kindness, to give a word of encouragement. Help us to be people who are listening and open to hearing whatever you might say. Help us to be self-denying. Father, often when you speak, it's a call to service. Help us to have that mentality, I am a servant of God. I'm on the clock for him. Whatever assignment he gives me, that's what I'll do. And Father, we invite you to speak to us today and this week. Speak to us what you would want to say to us, we pray. Speak to us if we are to be forgiving. Help us to forgive. Speak us if we are to help someone practically to do it. If we are to be reading our Bibles, if we're to be spending time in prayer, whatever you are saying to us, help us to do it. And we are so grateful that we live our lives under the mighty voice of God speaking to us. We thank you for this. Thank you that you are a speaking God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you go in your week.